The world waits for a miracle The heart longs for a little bit of hope Oh come, oh come Emmanuel A child prays for peace on earth She's calling out from a sea of hurt Oh come, oh come With tears of a mother A baby's cry is a sound of love Come down, come down, Emmanuel Whoa, here's a song for the suffering Here's a sigh the Prince of Peace has come He has come, Emmanuel Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you all here bright and early as we start our new uh, schedule for a little while and uh, see how we do with this. But we're glad you're all here this morning on this uh, glorious morning outside. So I'm going to invite you to stand with us, if you would, please, as we start with a, a, a medley of songs with Praise Adonaiah. Oh 
Yes, thank you, praise team. That was awesome, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Yeah. It, uh, little by little, we get back to normalcy, right? It's baby steps. Uh, uh, I'll start off this morning with devotions. And for these devotions, we will be looking at Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. So let's let's jump right into this. You can see it on the screen, or if you have a, a Bible with you, you can certainly read it there. So Romans 12, verse 1. I'll make sure that I have the right uh, version here, so I'll just read it off the screen. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters... In view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good and pleasing and perfect will. So verse 2, part 1, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So I'd like to quickly look at these words turned around slightly as follows. The renewing of your mind causes you to be transformed, and therefore you won't conform to the pattern of the world. Or I could state this conversely, if you are conforming to the world then you haven't been transformed because your mind hasn't been renewed. Or we could boil it down even more by saying it's uh, no offense to the smokers or the kings. If it sounds like a duck, walks like a duck, talks like a duck, it's probably a duck. Acts like the world, sounds like the world, thinks like the world, then it's probably of the world. So what's this about our minds needing to be renewed? Paul writes in Ephesians 4.23, calling us to, quote, be renewed in the spirit of your minds. So is there something inherently wrong with the spirit of my mind that requires it to be renewed? Yes, there is. Our minds are not by nature God-worshipping minds. They are by nature self-worshipping minds. We are inherently wretched and desperately in need of grace, the amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. Without renewing, our minds are like the minds of the world that Paul, here he calls them Gentiles. He writes about in Ephesians 4, 17 and 18, saying that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart." So this is a picture of our natural mind, the mind which hasn't been renewed and which needs to be made new and can only be made new by a double working of the Holy Spirit. So quoting John Piper, the spirit must work from the outside in through Christ's exalting truth and also from the inside out through truth embracing humility. So in closing, I'd I'd ask you to consider where you stand today regarding this renewing of your mind, this transformation of your life, and this non-conformity to the world. Have we allowed the Holy Spirit to do His work in us and on us? If so, shouldn't we be thinking, acting, or living, should, should we, yeah, We shouldn't be, let me rephrase that again. If so, we shouldn't be thinking, acting, or living as the world does. We should be different. Our view, our outlook, our perspective of everything that happens in this world must be seen, formed, and shaped through the lens of Christ, not through the lens of a certain political party, a certain particular social justice movement, or perhaps even some false corrupt identity that we have created for ourselves in our unrenewed minds and are living out in our untransformed lives. We must be worthy of Christ and of the label Christian, the original 
nonconformists in all of our thinking and actions. Amen. Uh, announcements. Uh, I guess announcements and uh, prayer requests kind of all run together here. So announcement-wise, I will say there is an offering box in the back. And big announcement, drum roll please from somebody. Yeah, there we go. You can now make your checks out to Waterway Church. It's kind of anticlimactic, but uh, we've been working on this for quite a while. So uh, you can now make them out to Waterway Church. If you do happen to make them out to media by some strange slip of the pen, then I think we can still deposit those too. So uh, moving to prayer requests. So we're going to continue to pray for Barry Hostetter and his family. Uh, I know there's a special event going on today that's uh, going to be happening there on the other side of the, uh, the grain facility. Um, so we're going to pray that Barry has a good day and he can enjoy it and see what's going on out there. Um, Sam Reburn has masses on both kidneys and will have a surgery to treat this problem on October 27th. Uh, a little bit of joy to offset some of these troubling things. So Justin and Kristen McCreary welcomed a son, Noah James, on Friday, 9 pounds, 21 inches. So if you see their grandparents, you can certainly congratulate them on that. Um, and uh, Liza Malone, who had been a key leader in our community classroom, uh, program here will be starting a job at the, uh, with the Oxford School District tomorrow. So we are missing her. Jesse assures me that we have a plan to handle her absence. She was, uh, she was awesome. She was a great part of that. Um, so just pray for the volunteers that are still here and uh, give them strength <laughs> as Kate is shaking her head uh, to do their jobs well and uh, we continue to be able to bless kids in this area through that program. Um, so I'll, I'm going to, uh, we'll have a quick prayer and then there's going to be a little special service happening here in a few minutes. Would, would you join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to gather, to walk through these doors, to, to worship you, to praise you. Uh, God, that's what this time is all about. That is what you have called the church to do uh, while we're here is to worship you, glorify you with singing, with teaching, with um, yeah, our attitudes, our thoughts. Um, may we also be the church as we go out into the community and impact uh, other people's lives through uh, yeah, conversations and actions and deeds. And uh, May we just shine brightly for you as we do that. We just uh, pray for all these things that are happening today. Uh, we pray for the walk that's going to be leaving from here at 1 o'clock. We pray that that may be a blessing to others. We pray that through that walk, uh, people in the community can see life and energy and love here at 550 Waterway Road. So, and we just pray your blessing on the rest of the time here. And uh, we pray that everything that we say and do will be pleasing and glorifying of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So just wanted to uh, make an announcement for those of you who are here in our first service and for those of you who are online. Um, we have an additional prayer request that was, uh, that was not mentioned specifically. Uh, Pastor Steve hurt his back a couple weeks ago, and it's just not getting better. And, uh, and he's in a back brace, and Steve likes to be moving and going and has just been slowed down. So today at our 1030 service, uh, if you're watching us online, this is being recorded at 830 on Sunday morning. But at our 1030 service today, uh, we're going to have a little anointing service. Uh, it'd be at this same time in the service. We're going to anoint him with oil and pray for him. Uh, and also we're going to have an invitation once we've prayed for him, if there's anyone else in the congregation who would like to be anointed for anything at all, that they can come forward and be anointed. Uh, we're not actually going through that this morning 
in this service, but I wanted to let you know that if that's something that you're in need of, well, stick around after Sunday school and here kind of early in the, in the 1030 service. We're going to be, be doing that as well. And, and you can be anointed with oil if there's anything physical or emotional or intellectual or spiritual that you're struggling with. Uh, it says in the scriptures, if, if anyone is sick, you know, call the elders together and, and anoint them in prayer. And so we're going to do that today at 1030. Just kind of wanted to give you guys a heads up of what's going on right now. The, the worship team is going to, is going to continue to lead us in song. But if, uh, if you have one of those kind of needs that you'd like to be prayed for, come back here at 1030 and, uh, and we're going to pray for you. And if, if you're online watching us today, and if you've got any particular prayer needs or anything that you'd like for us to pray for you about, you can reach us, uh, reach us online. You can look at our website, waterwaychurch.com. Or you can send us an email, uh, waterwaychurch at gmail.com. Or for any of you who are still uh, remembering our old email addresses, Media Church at Hotmail is still active as well. But we'd love to hear from you and pray for you uh, so that we can uh, bring all these requests before God. Uh, for now, how about if we stand and sing as we continue to praise our Lord? Uh, songs today kind of have a theme. It's the light of the world is Jesus. Okay, as we uh, try to navigate these these sometimes dark times, but uh, that's the focus. And you can join us as we sing the hymn called "The Light of the World Is Jesus." was lost in the darkness of sin the light of the world is jesus like sunshine at noonday his glory shone in the light of the world is jesus come to the light it is shining for thee sweetly the light has dawned upon me once i was blind but now i can see the light of the world is Jesus. No darkness have we who in Jesus abide. The light of the world is Jesus. We walk in the light when we follow our guide. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, it is shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. Ye dwellers in darkness with sin blinded eyes, the light of the world is Jesus. Go watch at his fading, and light will arise. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, it is shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. No need of the sunlight in heaven, we're told. The light of the world is Jesus. The Lamb is the light in the city of gold. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, it is shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. Shine, fill this land with the 
medley it's going to be a little hard to keep from tapping your toes I think I hope but uh, join us if you
church. How's it feel being here? It's interesting to look out. I see that even here on Sunday morning, we have uh, a lot of the same crowd who was here early on Saturday night. I guess you just like to be here first, don't you? Hear, hear it before anybody else. Well, get it while it's good. Yeah, because it might not be good later. <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> well, I... I um, I was blessed yesterday, uh, today, or yesterday at this spot, um, we had our AMEC virtual conference. And so what that means is that uh, we are part of a network of churches. There are 27 churches in the group called AMEC. AMEC stands for the Alliance of Mennonite Evangelical Congregations. And so there are 27 churches in our network. Most are here in southeastern PA, but we do have a church in Greenwood, Delaware. There's one in New York, and there are three in Oklahoma. And so we've got relationships all over the place. And, and through that network is how we work at accountability and how um, we've got an executive board uh, with an AMEC that kind of just keeps an eye on churches, makes sure pastors aren't getting weird and the things that they're teaching and all that. And, and we also offer support to each other if, if a particular church has a need for help with hiring someone or working through a mediation process or, or, or just is looking for advice. And, and I don't know if you're aware of this, but in the consultant world, there are consultants that market themselves at churches that are just incredibly expensive. Well, we're able to do a lot of those things as AMEC. We help each other out. So every two years, AMEC has a conference in the fall and we elect some officers and we approve a budget. And so that was going to happen at Indian Valley uh, Faith Fellowship, which is up in the Harleysville area. That was going to happen until the whole COVID thing hit and we decided it's not a great thing to have a whole bunch of people together in the same room coming from all over the country. Um, and so we did it via live, or did we kind of basically live stream through Zoom. And so we did that here in this room yesterday. There were about 10 people here running through all that. And then we had a bunch of people on Zoom. The, the Zoom was up on the screen and, and we were able to run through that. And so uh, I just wanted to pass along to you that that was another way that our church was able to kind of be a blessing in a way that God blessed us. We've got this new space that we're still, even after eight months, kind of figuring out how does this work? What does this look like? But having space like that and having some of the newer tech that we've got really allows us to uh, to host some things like that that might otherwise be a little difficult. So just wanted to kind of share a praise that the AMEC uh, biennial conference went well yesterday. Uh, I serve as the president of AMEC, and so if you have any more questions about it, uh, feel free to give me a call. Hey, what's this about? What's the deal? Who does this? What's it mean? Uh, I'd love to talk with you about that. 
But it is kind of interesting having two kind of big events on a weekend. Yesterday, that was Saturday, and a lot of my focus was there and just thinking about how to do that, who was here, what are we doing, what are we saying, what are we posting online, and all that kind of stuff. And then after our, after our, uh, our, our conference was over at about 1 o'clock yesterday afternoon, a couple of the other pastors were talking about like what they're preaching about today. And, and one of the things that we discussed as, as we were talking is that it seems like uh, everybody's got their own gifts and their own challenges as it comes to the way that we do our jobs, just the same way that you are with your job, right? There are some people where you work that you're like, what are you worried about? This is the easiest thing in the world. And then there's other stuff that kind of trip you up or that you just hate to do and somebody else says, oh, can I do that? I love it, right? Well, pastors and preachers are kind of the same way. We were talking about our, our, our things that we like and don't, and I told, told the guys, I said, the hardest thing for me about preaching is knowing what to preach about. Once I know what I'm preaching about, well, the rest is pretty easy. I mean, the Bible just lays that out. But for me, the hardest thing is always, okay, what is the topic this week, this month? What's the focus this year? And, uh, and for about a month and a half, I've been trying to teach and preach on political issues. Not failing because I don't know how to or because there's nothing to say, but failing because the timing has just never felt right. You've noticed here at, at Waterway, there's been a number of different things happening Sunday mornings, different people sharing, and that's been fantastic. But to have a chunk of time to talk about this, um, I, I've been trying to teach on political issues, not politicians, but the issues that they're discussing because it's good for us to be aware of what's happening, right? And I've been especially touched every time in the last couple of weeks I drive past the Catholic Church here in town. Have you noticed the last couple of weeks they have those little white crosses out by the road representing surgical abortions in America? I believe their sign says, since Roe v. Wade in 1973. I'm not 100% certain what the sign says. I, I always notice it at the last minute. But just knowing what those crosses represent and knowing that that church is putting that out has, has kind of touched me. And so, um, you know, I, 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 that inspired me to do a little research. You may know that nearly 60 million abortions have been performed in the United States, and this is medically and surgically and induced. This is stuff that happens on purpose, okay? 60 million abortions performed in the United States since Roe v. Wade in 1973. 60 million. And that stirs something in me. And of course, abortion is one of those topics, and there are a dozen others, that get talked about by our politicians when they're running for office. And, and generally speaking, one party tends to be on this side of the issue, and one party tends to be on the others, but there are individuals in each party that crosses over. And so that stirs something in me. And, and just that experience there at the Catholic Church in Oxford has got me thinking, boy, I want to talk about some of these political issues. However, God just seems to keep shutting it down. I, I don't know why. I can't explain it to you. But Pastor Tony Murren at Mount Vernon is doing a good job talking about some of these big issues in politics. He's been doing it for the last four weeks. He's going through the beginning of November. He's talking about these political issues, what the Bible says about each one. If you're interested, search for the Counterculture series on YouTube by Mount Vernon Christian Church, MVCC. Go to YouTube, search for MVCC. You'll find a series of great sermons. He and I actually sat down together a couple weeks ago and planned what they might look like, you know, thinking that we'd, they'd do it there and we'd do it here, but yet God keeps shutting it down here at Waterway. Maybe Mount Vernon's the only place that needs to be talked about right now. I don't know. But if you want to find some good sermons, go listen to Pastor Tony online. Stuff's available right now. But as I said, the, the hardest thing about preaching is knowing the topic, okay? What is it that I'm supposed to talk about next week? What is it that I'm supposed to talk about? Sometimes it even comes up, what am I supposed to talk about tomorrow? Because God changes minds and changes focuses. But here's what's been laid on the heart for today. It's Psalm 146. Psalm 146. Now, this actually does tie into our politics. It ties into the way that we think about the things that are happening around us. Psalm 146 is um, one of the last five psalms. There are 150 psalms in the Bible. The last five are all very similar in that they all start with praise the Lord. And there are these five last praise songs, that psalms. They are just telling people to praise. And, and um, so Psalm 146 is the first of the last of these praise psalms. Psalm 146, it says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. 
Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner, sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. It's interesting that here in this praise psalm, there is just one instruction. In 10 verses, there is one instruction, right? Unless you read praise the Lord as an instruction or a command, which we probably could. But, but that one instruction is negative. It's what not to do. Did you catch it? Did you notice it there? It's in verse number three. Verse number three of Psalm 146 says, do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. Well, why is that line so important? That one instruction here in this, in this psalm of praise. At the end of psalms, we've got these five praising God, telling us to praise God. And yet there's this one additional instruction that the psalmist throws in. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. Why is that there? Well, here in the end of the book, Psalm 146 it has been suggested, is kind of a bookend to the beginning of Psalms. And I don't know if you know Psalm 2. Has anyone ever memorized Psalm 2? I know there are a handful of people in this church or maybe in this room who have memorized a number of the Psalms. If you know Psalm 2, you know that it starts like this. Why do the nations, some versions say plot, some versions say conspire. Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. That's Psalm 2, very, back, very much back at the beginning of the book. And here today we look at Psalm 146. In Psalm 2 it says, the kings of the earth rise up, the rulers band together, God laughs at them. Here in Psalm 146, it tells us in the midst of our praise, do not put your hope in princes. It doesn't say, don't care about politics. Note that it doesn't say, don't argue about politics. That can be fun, right, if you find the right arguing partner. It doesn't even say, don't participate in politics. What does God say? He says, hey, I've, I've got my own king. I've put him in place, and by the way, he's the best of them all. David was a king, and he wrote most of the Psalms. He was a prince in power here on earth. And yet he spoke for God. So the implication here is that we're not saying that all politics is bad, but I think today, in the way that many of the people around us do their politics, this warning in Psalm 146 is a good warning, isn't it? Not to put your hope in princes. Not to put your hope in humanity. Now, if, if I would have just backed off, if that prince's thing wasn't in there, and if we just said, don't put your hope in humanity, that would be easy to hear, wouldn't it? Like, that'd be pretty easy to apply universally. Well, of course I wouldn't put my hope in humans because I don't know if you noticed it or remembered it, but the rest of this little piece of Psalms, it says in verse 4, when human spirits depart, he's talking about the princes and all humanity in general, when their spirit departs, they return to the ground on that very day, their plans come to nothing. In other words, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. We don't put our hope in humanity, do we? But it's interesting here, the psalmist gets very specific and says, don't put your hope in princes. Why? It's because so many of us are tempted, just as they were 3,000 years ago when these psalms were being written. We are tempted to put our hope in our princes. Not, not just those who are literally born of royal families, the, the prince of this nation or that one, but people who are in power, people who are like kings, people who have the ability to rule. Psalm 146 tells us, do not put your hope in princes, because the prince is not the foundation of your hope. So, 
as we try to apply this. This is one of the fun things about the Psalms, wrestling with what do we do with this? Because it says praise the Lord. Well, we've been practicing that, right? Today we've been praying. We praise the Lord for baby Noah who was born on Friday night. And we praise the Lord through songs. You were, you were all joining in as we were singing about Jesus being our light, God being our light. How do we apply this Psalm? Well, we praise God. And, and how do we know that we're doing a good job of not putting our hope in princes? How do we make sure that princes are not the foundation of our hope? Well, I think Jeff Foxworthy helps us. Now, Jeff Foxworthy, I know it's getting a little long in the tooth. He's been around for a long time, but you all know his famous line, don't you? You might be a redneck if, I mean, the man make a whole career out of this. He's a bazillionaire because he's just awfully good at finishing that sentence. You might be a redneck if, some of you even have your favorite one. Some of you even have that on a t-shirt, don't you? Gerald, I'll bet you have a t-shirt that has a redneck something on it somewhere in the bottom of your closet. Maybe during COVID, that closet got cleaned out. But how do you know if a prince is the foundation of your hope? Well, well maybe we can let Foxworthy help us. You might be putting your hope in princes if. You might be. So, so these are just some tests that we can take. Some ways that we, individually, maybe corporately, but especially individually, we can challenge ourselves. The foundation of our hope is important to consider because it affects everything about us. The foundation of our hope affects our use of time. You might be putting your hope in princes if you're spending more time with the news than you are with God and your Bible. If the first thing that you check every day is, what did he say? What did she say? How did that debate go? What's been said about what they said? What's been written about the debate? If that's the first thing that you check into and your devotions and your scripture and your time with God is later, well, that's a good check. You might be putting your hope in princes, right? And if you're wondering, this, this use of time this applies to just about every other passion in life as well. If you're spending all your time watching sports, then you might be putting all of your hope in sports. If you just can't stop thinking about a person, then you might just be putting your hope in a person. If all you can think about is your next purchase or your next meal or your next drink or your next job or your next dollar, then that's where you've put your hope and you've got your hope in the wrong place because all that stuff is just ashes and dust. The psalmist says, and God tells us over and over in his scripture, put our hope in the Lord. And yet we humans so easily stray. Here in Psalm 146, it says, don't put your hope in your princes. Well, if you have a relationship that's been compromised by politics, you might be putting your hope in princes. Do you have any relationships in your family that are on edge because of politics? Because somebody believes this and somebody else believes that. If those relationships, which mean a lot to you, if they are compromised because of your politics, you might, underline the word might, right? We all have to consider this carefully. Praise the Lord, we can have a renewed mind that allows us to think about these things and not just go along with the pattern of the world, right? We can think through this. But if you have relationships that are being compromised by politics, you might be putting your hope in princes, that might be too important to you. It might be too primary to you. Might be. Now, maybe not. Maybe it's the other person's problem. Maybe they're putting too much hope in princes, and maybe they just won't stop talking about their favorite prince. That's annoying too, isn't it? And that can really divide a family. Well, okay. If that's their problem, pray for them. Don't let any prince get between your relationship with them. But, you know, if you have a relationship that's been compromised by politics, you might be putting your hope in princes. And don't do that, right? I, I, it's kind of the conclusion. I, I don't want to spoil anything. But, but if you are doing any of these things that I suggest you might be doing, stop it. <laughs> right? Like, you can kind of fill in that blank here as we go. If that's a problem, stop it. And by the way, if the sun is shining in too lightly on you, go ahead and hop up and, and move around. If, it won't be a distraction for us since I've called you out. Jonathan and Katie Beth, I just feel bad as the sun moves around. Back to the foundations of our hope. If you have a relationship that's been compromised by politics, you might be putting your hope in princes. If you have ever gotten angry just at a yard sign or a flag or a bumper sticker, you might be putting your hope in princes. 
I know a lot of people that maybe that's just kind of fun and, and a lot of people can live and let live, right? In fact, we should be able to do that. That is one of, the, one of the blessings that was planned into the creation of our country is that we would have different opinions and we can argue about things and, and we can rise above our arguments then and work together once things are decided. But boy, that's getting more and more difficult and, and we can feel it, right? Because let, let's be honest, how many of you have driven past a house and you saw that yard sign and, and even though you didn't know who lived there, even though you didn't know anything about them, you were even going maybe too quickly to even look at their house and see if the paint was peeling or the car was dirty. But you saw that sign and just for the next couple minutes, there was this little adrenaline spike in you that just... <clears throat> it happens, right? Or, or you pull up behind that person at the red light and, and you get finally close enough to read the bumper sticker and you read the bumper sticker and you either like it or you don't like it because it's about some prince and, and something in you reacts, right? And for the next little while, you're thinking about what you'd like to say to the person driving that truck. Or maybe you'd like to just go up and, and shake their hand because they think just like you do. Have you ever sat there at that red light imagining what that person must believe, what they must think, and how wrong they are? Well, without ever knowing that person, talking to them, even seeing the front of their face, if you have ever gotten angry at a bumper sticker, you might be putting your hope in princes. Be careful about that. God doesn't want us to, to use all of our emotional and spiritual energy driving around town, just getting worked up at the signs that we see. Now, I, I know this is, this is coming from a guy who just told you about how worked up I get seeing those little white crosses out in front of the Catholic Church. I, I know. I, we, can, we can certainly let God inspire us but let's not let these signs tear us down and steal our peace, right? If, if a sign or a bumper sticker or a flag is stealing your peace, you might be putting your hope in princes. Now, we know lately there's been a lot of discussions about which flags should be up where. Well, there's a lot of talk about monuments, right? And some of these things that do get people worked up. Oh, those are complex conversations. But, but if you're getting terribly worked up about any kind of a physical thing in this earth, just be careful with that because maybe that's overtaken you. Now, now you notice the mites and the maybes here. Again, there are times when God gives us deep and strong conviction, but even then he calls us to act in a certain way with kindness, with love, with grace, with forbearance, with honesty, and with integrity, right? There's no excuse to just fly off the handle because that thing made me mad. No, stop it. We're not animals, we're human beings. And we are Christians with renewed minds, right? We don't just go around reacting to everything that happens to us, and, and we shouldn't. If you find yourself that you're just reacting to the things that are around you, you need to stop, and I'm not kidding here, you need to stop and very seriously consider your priorities. You need to consider your mental and emotional and spiritual and physical health if all the things around you are just causing you to strike because that's not how humans are built. God built us to be partners with him and rise above all of that, to be conformed to his pattern and not the patterns of this world, right? If you find yourself slinking into that, and sometimes we do, we get tired, we get frustrated, things grind on and on and I've had it and I'm over it. Okay, I know, we feel that, but. If that's you all the time, let me just tell you, that's not healthy. That's not where you need to be. You need to talk to someone. Talk to me, and I will find someone who can help you to have your mind renewed and to have the kind of rest and refreshment and restoration that you need to be able to live with God. I seek that out. I have certain people in my life that when I feel that temperature going up, I'll go, hey, can we sit down? I just need to talk. Can I have a morning from you? Okay, sometimes I pay people to do that because they're professionals, and sometimes it's just a friend who's in my life. Okay, this is important stuff. We don't want, we don't want all these things stealing our peace, and certainly, if you've ever gotten angry just at a yard side or a flag or a bumper sticker, you might be putting too much hope in princes. You might be putting too much hope in princes if your political convictions have ever clashed with your religious convictions and won. 
If your politics has ever overridden your religion, and now your religion is not quite the same as your faith, right? The faith is, is when we believe and we put our hope and our faith in God, and he saves us, and, and our religion is really just all of our response to that. It's coming to church is religion. It's the thing that we do to act out our faith. It's the thing that we do to show our devotion to God. It's, it's the songs that we sing, and it's the service that we do. It's the prayers that we pray. It's all good stuff, should be good stuff. That's what religion is. And if your political convictions have ever shaded your religion, well, that's backwards. Your religion should be shading your political convictions. But if they're not, you might be putting your hope in princes. Your, your politics ha have gotten so amped up because of the people you support, the princes you're in favor of, that you're no longer putting forward good and true and holy religion. Okay? You need to be careful about that. You need to be careful that the foundation of your hope doesn't allow you to slip away from graciousness. The foundation of our hope is the Lord, and, and he calls us to be gracious and forgiving and kind. But if you've ever questioned someone else's value or their qualification to hear the gospel because of what you know about their politics, you might be putting your hope in princes. We can't let our ability to share and our willingness to share be affected by what that other person believes about which candidate they ought to vote for, and maybe they'd even tell you who you ought to vote for. We're called to serve those in need. A couple of other things, quick. If, if the election scares you, you might be putting your hope in princes. Because you know what? No matter who wins and who loses, God is still on the throne, and his plan is still going to work out. I have my preferences. You do too. That's fine. But if you're at a spot where this is scary, let me just tell you, whoever it is that gets voted in, they're not going to cause the end of the world unless God wants that to happen. So everybody just chill a little, okay? Because the princes of the world are not our hope. If the results of an election devastate you, everybody's disappointed when they lose, right? I mean, it's that way with football. It's that way with politics. Both well, I'm going to be careful. But if the results devastate you, put you in an emotional spot that, that are just dragging you low for days and you're bitter, well, then you might be putting your hope in princes and what does Psalm 146 tell us to do very specifically? Don't do that, okay? And you might be putting your hope in princes if you wished we spent more time at church talking about princes. It's not about whether politics is something we should do. It's about our priorities in life as a child of God and as subjects of his kingdom. So we all have a decision to make, you and I. Where will we put our hope? What is the foundation of our hope? Is it God? Or have we put our foundation of hope upon the princes of this world? Well, they don't deserve it. Only God does. So let's put our hope in the right place. Church, you know this. So many of you online, you know this in your hearts, that our foundation must be on the Lord, but it's amazing how other priorities, and, and not all of us wrestle with princes, some of us have these other priorities that sneak in, but boy, other priorities can just creep in, and all of a sudden, God's foundation isn't number one anymore. We need to stop that. We need to follow the Lord all together. I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward as we have a closing song this morning. But church, I want to encourage you to remember Colossians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul to the church in Colossus wrote, Since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. See, your life isn't even just here on this earth. Your, your life isn't underneath whatever prince might be installed on whichever throne. No, our life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, then we also will appear with him in glory. And there, it says in Colossians 3.11, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Church, would you stand as we sing our closing song this morning? The closing song is, Where I Belong. Sometimes it feels like I'm breathing.
Am I alive? I won't keep searching for answers that aren't here to find. the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of God's glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for those of us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under the feet of Jesus Christ and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Okay, church, go out of here now living as if Ephesians 1 is true, that we live for Jesus Christ. Everything else falls after that. Just make sure that Jesus Christ is the only one who is the foundation of your hope. Amen?